All right, so let's take a look at practice 5.6. And the first function they're giving us is a tangent function. And I know there's you're tempted probably to look at those choices and make some determinations from that, but I think you should try to graph this yourself and then look at the choices. So let's draw a straight line, and then you have to know what the tangent form looks like. So the tangent has this form, the one that's increasing. Remember, cotangent has the same form, but it's decreasing. And it has vertical asymptotes. Now, for regular old tangent, this is at minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So 3 is our stretching factor that just controls how steeply this climbs, stretches it in the vertical. And then our b, right here, which we'll identify as 1 fourth in front of the x, that's the one that stretches it in the horizontal. And with trig functions, we call that the period. Now remember, for tangent and cotangent, the period is pi. So this is pi divided by b, which gives us 4 pi, dividing by a fourth. And so we know the period has to be 4 pi. And we know it goes half this distance, and it goes half this distance. And this is 0. So for tangent, it's pretty easy if we just take 4 pi and divide it by 2 to give us what half of these, what one of these widths are for a half. See, that's 2 pi. And so we know what this must go from 0 to 2 pi. And then this must go from 0 to minus 2 pi. And then we have our complete period then of 4 pi. And there's no shift here. And so that's our answer. And let's check out then the uh, selections they give us. So we're still going through the origin. So A does not go through the origin. B does go through the origin, but it's a cotangent slope there going down. And then C does go through the origin, and it has it from minus 2 pi to 2 pi. So there is our answer. So now we got minus 2 tangent. So, draw our line. And on this line, you then have to know the form of tangent. So tangent has this form. And it has vertical asymptotes on each side. And this is what repeats over and over. So let's take care of the first thing first, the minus sign. So the minus sign will reflect this about the x-axis. So this piece will rotate down here, and so we'll get this shape then. So I'm just going to redraw that. So looks clear so we're getting the cotangent shape now and that's from the minus sign now 2 is our stretching factor it just stretches this vertically and then we have 1 third x so we identify b the factor that affects the period is one third, and the period for tangent is pi over b, and dividing by a third will get us three pi. And that's all our information. We took care of the minus sign in our graph, 
two can't really do much in our graph. How can we make it, you know, look steeper? Not much we can do with two when just freehanding it like this. And then there was one third, which gives us our period. So now we need to, need to know something else about tangent, that this period here for tangent is minus pi over two to pi over two. That's the standard period there for regular old tangent. And there's no shift left or right, which means the tangent is still sitting where it's at, at the origin. But now our period is three pi over two. So the whole length here has to be three pi. I said over two, I don't know why, three pi. So the easiest thing to do when, when we have the origin is to just divide this by two. Because half is going this way, so this must now be three pi over two, and the other half is going this way, which now must be minus three pi over two. And that'll give us our full period then of three pi with tangent still centered on the origin because there's no left or right shifting. There's no phase shift. And that's all our information. So we'll check out what they give us here. Now we do have the, it still goes through the origin. So just some simple things to look while we're checking out these graphs. It still goes to the origin. It now has the cotangent shape because of that minus sign. So A does not have the cotangent shape. B does. B has the cotangent shape. It goes to the origin. Those are two good things. And so now if we check the asymptotes, we see this is minus 3 power 2 and positive 3 power 2. That's exactly what we're looking for. But it doesn't hurt to at least check what the others are. So C has the shape we want. Uh, also going from minus three power two to three, uh oh. So these both have the same asymptotes. So let's check that out. D, however, does not have the cotangent shape. So it's between B and C here. And that's tough. But what you are going to think about here is that the 2 stretches it vertically. So if you look at B, it's got kind of a more rounded shape there. But if we look at C, it's got a steeper shape. So C is being multiplied by some positive number to get that steeper shape there. So going with C. All right, well, I'm going to have to say that I am not happy with that question. Uh, it turns out that the answer is the shallower slope, which is uh, very difficult to judge without a calculator. So apparently C must be, mul if this is, if this is, if B is multiplied by two, then C must be multiplied by say six or eight. So I consider that kind of deceptive there that, well, you heard the reasoning I went through. <laughs> so if something like this encounters, you encounter this, you can always send it to me. If you go up to question help and hit ask my instructor, that sends it to me and I'll take a look because, hey, I'm not going to agree with everything the computer does here. I think that's a pretty rough distinction to have to make by eyeballing without using a calculator, which is what we're expecting you to do here, not use a calculator. 
Um, with that said, check out the next one. Again, send this to me if you have these type of issues or other issues. So for cotangent x. So they're going to give us another. Okay. Upon further inspection, this is okay because of the choices we're given this time. So they're giving us another stretching factor, and that's the only distinction here, which is pretty rough without a calculator. However, the choices they give here, though, we can make a distinction. So cotangent, you want to know its shape. And you want to know where its vertical asymptotes are. Now for cotangent, that's going to be 0 and pi. Remember, for tangent, just to throw this in there, uh, remember, tangent is minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so cotangent actually goes from 0 to pi on its vertical asymptotes. And the 4 stretches this. So it stretches it in some manner that would look like that. Stretches it vertically. Now again... Very hard to determine something like that by eyeballing. In other words, if I graph this for you, is would you know that to be a stretch of four? But the choices here, however, we notice A is the tangent shape. B is a cotangent shape. C is tangent shaped. And D is cotangent. So B and D are the cotangent shapes. And if we look at B, it has its vertical asymptotes at 0 and pi, which is what we'd expect. And if we look at D, the vertical asymptotes are at minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, which is something you would see with tangent. So here the choice is clear. It's going to be B. So let's see how this stretching factor works out. Now in this case we do have a period change, so that will most likely uh, help us determine the right one. So cotangent, let's draw our line. Let's draw in the cotangent shape and its vertical asymptotes. Zero and pi, the standard shape there. Now the first thing we have here is a minus sign. So that's going to reflect it across the x-axis and that will give it then the tangent shape. And so that's what the minus sign will do. Now again, our 4 is our stretching factor. So you know what? I'm just going to call that a stretch of 4. And then we have pi over 3, which is B. And remember, the period for tangent and cotangent is pi. Divided by B is 3. So this period is 3. Now there's no phase shift. There's no moving it left or right. So that means the cotangent is still sitting where it sits. Its center isn't moving. However, these wings here can expand and contract. But it stays centered because it's not moving left or right. And we know the entire period 
has to be 3. So this distance, now this standard distance is pi, the period of tangent, but now it has to be 3. And it has to stay centered. Now in this case, it's good to know where the cotangent is centered halfway between zero and pi, halfway being pi over two. So if we're gonna go three both ways, well, we know 1.5 is this way and 1.5 is this way. So that would make this new endpoint here, this new vertical asymptote, would have to be pi over 2, the center, because the center hasn't moved. We haven't moved it left or right. And then the next asymptote is just going to be plus 1.5 away. And likewise for the left one, we know this is going to be pi over 2, and then we're going to subtract 1.5. I'm going to need to uh, get my calculator just to see what this decimal number really is. So pi over 2 plus 1.5 gives us a, it's about a 3. And this one is about a, this is about 0 almost. 0.1. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a tangent shape that's centered at pi over 2 that has its right vertical asymptote at about 3 and its left at about 0. So let's see what we got. Three choices. Um, a and B are the correct shape, the tangent shape. So C is not a choice. And let's look at what we have. And we have the stretching factor problem again. Because both these are going from 0 to 3. That goes to 0 to 3. This goes to 0 to 3. And so now we have this stretching factor again. Which one of these graphs represents the correct stretching factor without using a calculator? Well, I'm not liking these type of problems. I think the detail here is a little bit too high and distracts from the graph transformations here we're supposed to be learning. And what we can do, and it isn't like this isn't bad information, this is good to know. And something that usually just occurs with time as you do trig is that you start remembering that there's a tangent of 45 degrees where it's one because that's where sine and cosine are both square root of two over two. And there's the same point with tangent. And this point is always gonna be halfway between the center and the vertical asymptote, so right in the center there. This is where the tangent or cotangent function will output one. Now ours is gonna output one but be multiplied by four, which means we should look for a result of four. So if we look at our prospects here, A, so at about halfway between the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote, about halfway is about right here. About halfway, is it outputting four? Uh, it is. Whereas we look at our other candidate, if we look halfway between the 
x-intercept and vertical asymptote, so halfway being about right here. We see halfway, it's not even outputting one. So this one's being multiplied by a fraction, so it's flattening it out actually from the normal tangent form. So I went with the steeper one last time, that didn't turn out to be the right answer. I'm gonna go with the steeper one again. And that's what they want. So I won't do that to you on the test. Um, not bad information to know tangent and cotangent are one at certain angles. For normal tangent that's and cotangent, that's 45 degrees, pi over four. So let's see what this next one is they got. All right, so just looking ahead a little bit there because the wording on this one might be a little confusing. So when you see this problem, they're giving you a graph and it's going to be a sine or cosine function. And what they want is the reciprocal. So if you're given sine, then you're going to look for the cosecant. If you get cosine, you're going to look for the secant. And remember, these reciprocal functions always connect with the bumps. And it's this reciprocal function that they're looking for. So they want the reciprocal of sine. So in this case, they want us to get cosecant. So let's check it out. And first off, the minus sign means this is flip. So the normal sign function looks like that, which puts the bumps here and here. But for us, that's flipped because of the minus sign. So cosecant usually up here, but now it's been flipped to down here because of the minus sign. So we know we have a minus cosecant that we're dealing with. And they're also giving us one fifth as the amplitude. Remember one fifth is also the secant amplitude, I put in quotes there, the amplitude for secant and cosecant. But remember these functions touch. So that means we also have a one-fifth on our cosecant. And x over three, or b is this one-third, that affects the period. But the period of cosecant here is gonna be the same period as the sine function we're being given. Because it has to connect those bumps. The sine and cosecant, these bumps are always connected. So they're telling us this is going from zero to six pi by looking at the graph. And so nothing changes. So, I don't know, it's a very complicated way for you just to get, for you just to switch sign to cosecant. A uh, very complicated way when that's all they're asking for. Oh, there's another part. 
Oh, there is. Now we want to choose the graph. All right, well, we already got it drawn out. So let's see what we got. Uh, A, notice that the red it crosses the y-axis. That's not the case with our picture. B is a candidate. Uh, however, notice this right here is curved up where ours is curved down. So B is not a candidate. We look at C here. Again, it's curved up. That's no good. And D. D, we finally get a curve down. And then our curve up, 0 to 6 pi. So that's what we got. It's curved down. It's curved up. 0 to 6 pi. So the graph part there was cool. Um, getting the function though was kind of lame. <laughs> a lot of words just to switch that trig function. So let's check out what we got here. Another. Um, oh, but we are dealing with cosecant. So stretching factors will be much easier to deal with. So stretching factors are more complicated with tangent and cotangent. Because it's difficult to say... You know, what type of stretch is that? Is it a stretch of 4? Is it a stretch of 10? Um, but that's only for tangent and cotangent. Oops, I was drawn over there. You didn't see that. Remember, the 7 here is this, quote, amplitude. Remember, cosecant goes with sine, and these bumps have to touch. And these bumps touch at 7. And that's all we're looking for. And this is, there's no shift. So this is 0 to 2 pi, the standard period. There's no shifts at all. There's no B. There's no C. And so that's our picture. Let's see what our options are. Uh, A is crossing the y-axis, that's no good for us. B is curved up and then curved down. That looks good. And they're being a little bit clever here by only labeling 4 pi way over here. So we got 2 pi then right here, which is what we have in our picture. So B is looking good. Um, however, we did not check the bump, and this is at 7 as well. So the bumps are touching at 7, so that looks good. C, uh, for C, we have this crossing of the y-axis down here. That's no good. That's not in our picture. And D. Uh, D looks good, except it's flipped. So ours starts as curved up, but this one starts curved down. So this one's actually flipped of what we want. And so B is the only candidate. So 9 secant. Again, stretching, not a problem with sine, cosine, cosecant, or secant. Stretching factors, easy to, easy to deal with in these cases. So secant corresponds to cosine. So cosine. Now the secant is the one that does cross the y-axis. And the 9 tells us where the bumps are touching. And an output of 9. 
So that's the picture we're looking for. Something that crosses the y-axis, opens up, has the bumps touch at nine. See what we got? This one opens up, crosses the y-axis, and these bumps, two, four, six, eight, ten, uh, oh boy, that uh, could be nine. Uh, one more thing I should actually say on here is the period, in case we do need that information, the period has not changed, so this is still zero to two pi. And two pi is about six, which is also where this period ends. And that looks good. Uh, a, right off the bat, is a candidate. B, no good. We have the Y crossing in the negative region where our Y crossing is in the positive. So that's no good. C has an X crossing, a Y crossing, I'm sorry. Oh, it opens up. That's all good stuff. But this crossing right here is definitely not at nine. It's about at five or so. So that's no good. And D has our Y crossing in the negative region there. That's no good for us. So the only candidate is A. So cosecant. Cosecant goes with sine. So there's sine. And cosecant is the one that punches the bumps there for the sine function. And we have a minus sign. That flips the whole picture. So it flips the whole picture, that minus sign. The three, that's where the bumps touch. So these bumps are touching at an output of three. And pi. Pi, we have a B factor here. And we have a period. Now we are dealing with cosecant, so that period for cosecant is 2 pi divided by b and we get 2 so our distance from this point to this point is 2 now that's our period now this function didn't move left or right. There's no phase shift. So it hasn't moved left or right. It's just expanded or contracted. But its middle hasn't moved. So where is the middle of the sine function? Well, remember, I'm going to write on the bottom here, sign the normal sign goes from 0 to 2 pi and its middle is pi all right just had to uh, take a moment there i was just thinking about what i was doing here and thought there was something to say about how we're trying to expand these about a point and I actually chose pi here, which would be a mistake. And the reason that is, let's see if you have sine. They have a sine function. And it's any number you want times x. So actually, we usually put b there. Let me do that. So we have sine of any number times x. Now, what are we guaranteed to happen here? Well, we're guaranteed that if we plug zero in, b times zero will always be zero. And sine of zero is zero. 
And so this is why I like to commonly say the sine function starts here. This is the point that's always guaranteed no matter what b is, because b times zero is always zero, and sine of zero is zero. With cosine, we have a similar thing. b times any, any number b times x. When x is zero, well, zero times b is zero, and cosine zero is one. All right, well, I apologize this for, for this awkwardness here, but I lost some video there, I noticed, in putting everything together. And let me just finish up what I was saying there, is the point I wanted to make is how you expand functions, what point you expand it upon. And for all the functions, you expand around zero, except for tangent. Tangent, you do zero, but zero is actually the middle. So for all the other functions, zero is the starting point of the function. For all the other, all five, except for tangent, zero is actually in the middle of the tangent function. And the rest I was saying in that part that got cut off is what this means is, is if you have a tangent function, and that is not a tangent function, uh, if you have a tangent function, we have to expand around the center point. So when you expand and contract this, it expands about the center here. So if we contract it, it'll look like this. And if we expand it, it'll look like that. Now that's different than say the sine function because the sine function, we don't expand halfway. For all the other sine functions, we expand at the start. So the sine function contracts like this, as well as all the other ones. The sine function does not expand and contract about the middle point. So it does not do this. So all six trig functions, I'm sorry, all five, five trig functions at the start, tangent is the one that expands around the middle. And since I'm redoing this part again, I thought we could actually pull this up on Desmos. And if you check out tangent, so here's regular old tangent, and now we're going to multiply it by 2x. And so we see that's contracting around the origin and then here's 3x and you can see it even got even slimmer so it's expanding and contracting around the origin if we look at sine sine's going to expand and contract around the origin as well but th this is the start of the sine function and so notice now as we multiply by two, it's squished in more. But it's not squished in around the halfway point, it's squished in around the origin, the start of the sine function. And then three X squishes it even more. But notice that these points all cross the origin. They're all squishing and expanding and contracting around the start of the function. So the whole point of all that was that when I was doing this problem here, that I ended up choosing pi to expand around, which I realized was a mistake. You have to expand around zero. That's why I ended up going through all that. Um, I actually lost that problem now because of uh, my math lab's random generator. So I don't have the same problem anymore. I think that answer was B though. But going on to the last one here. So we have cosecant 
of x minus 3 pi over 2. So we have finally a phase shift here. So there's no stretching factor. There's no amplitude, quote, quote, for the cosecant function. There's no B value, so there's no change in the period. The only thing we have is a phase shift. So cosecant goes along with sine. So here is cosecant touching the bumps. Now sine normally starts at zero and goes to two pi, exactly the same as cosecant. However, everything is gonna get shifted to the right. This whole thing is gonna get shifted to the right, everything. So that means even our asymptotes, these are all gonna get shifted to the right. And so that means then this new asymptote will be three power over two and getting a common denominator here of multiplying by two over two and we'll get seven pi over two. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for something that's up, down, does not cross three pi over two and goes to seven pi over two. So let's see what we got. For A, uh, opens down first, that's no good. B opens down first, that's no good. C opens up first, that's good. It's the bumps touch at one as they should since we don't have an A value here. They're giving us three pi over two as our vertical asymptote first. So that's good. That's our candidate. Well, let's check out D. Opens up, opens down, that's all good. Three pi over two is our starting vertical asymptote. That's also good. However, notice these bumps touch at an output of two, and that is no good. We don't have a two coefficient. So our only prospect here is C. So overall, um, still a good homework. I do think that one has a few issues uh, because tangent and cotangent are very tough to eyeball when you have stretching factors. Now the other four functions are easy to deal with stretching factors because for sine and cosine, the stretching factor is the amplitude. And for cosecant and secant, the stretching factor tells us where these bumps meet. So stretching factors, no problem with those four functions. Uh, stretching factors can be challenging, though, with tangent and cotangent. So I just want to say again, it's not something I'm going to put on the test. I think that's a little bit too difficult to, to eyeball. So there is practice 5.6.